So at this point, everyone on the planet has experienced a pandemic and everyone on the planet knows what a pandemic means for themselves as individuals, for their families and for their communities. No one, no one on the planet wants to see a next pandemic in their lifetimes. And in particular, no one wants to see a next pandemic in the next decade or the next year. It's clear from the presentations that you've heard earlier today that the present pandemic may have originated through natural spillover or may have originated through research related spillover. It is also clear, and you just heard this in the last presentation, that the next pandemic also may originate either through natural spillover or through research related spillover. Therefore, it is crucial, it is imperative to take steps to reduce the risks of both of those routes of spillover and to do so now. Uh, that means from the standpoint of natural spillover, it is crucial to restrict wildlife markets, to restrict wildlife farming, and to restrict interactions between humans and high-risk wildlife, particularly bats. And with respect to research-related spillover, it is crucial to enhance biosafety, biosecurity, and bio-risk assessment. In my presentation, I will introduce those three terms. I'll provide definitions, strategies, summary of the current status, and the crucial next steps. Turning to definitions, biosafety represents protections against accidental release of pathogens. Biosecurity represents protections against deliberate release of pathogens. And bio-risk assessment represents risk-benefit assessment of high-risk research on pathogens. For biosafety, which again is protection against accidental release, we obtain biosafety through a combination of controls and strategies. The controls include engineering controls, which are physical infrastructure, containment structures that uh, reduce or mitigate risks and impact of exposure operational controls, which are personal protective equipment and procedures that uh, reduce or mitigate risks of exposure, risks and impacts of exposure. And management controls include planning, training, and incident reporting. These three classes of controls are grouped together to form biosafety standards. For pathogens, three biosafety standards are relevant. The first is biosafety level two, or BSL2, which is appropriate for low risk pathogens. Biosafety level two mandates a lockable door, screened windows, an uncarpeted floor, a sink and eye wash, a decontamination or sterilization device, gown and gloves. Biosafety level three, or BSL3, is appropriate for use with moderate risk pathogens. BSL-3, Biosafety Level 3, mandates all of the requirements of BSL-2 plus negative air pressure in the laboratory space so that air flows to the potentially contaminated airspace rather than away from it. Tandem self-closing doors and seal windows to maintain negative air pressure, a biosafety cabinet, and a rear closing gown. Biosafety Level 3, or BSL-3, is appropriate for use with the highest risk pathogens. BSL, biosafety level four uh, mandates all of the features in BSL-3 plus a pass-through decontamination or sterilization device so that all items that enter the lab facility other than humans must be decontaminated before leaving. Mandates an exit shower and a dunning doffin roomless shower so that humans and their protective uh, personal protective equipment can be decontaminated before humans leave the facility. It mandates a positive pressure suit and an independent air supply. The top image shows a representative BSL-2 facility. It is a standard laboratory space, optionally with a biosafety cabinet. Uh, researchers work in gown and gloves. The center image shows a representative biosafety level three facility. It is a, a negative air pressure facility with a biosafety cabinet. Researchers wear a front closing gown and optionally, as in this case, face protection and a powered air purifying respirator, which is a battery operated backpack device that draws air from the laboratory, passes it through a, 
a high efficiency particulate filter and delivers it to the researcher. The bottom figure shows a representative BSL-4, biosafety level four facility. In this case, we have a negative air pressure facility with pass-through decontamination device, uh, showers at exit, donning doffing room with shower, and researchers work in positive pressure suits, so-called space suits, with independent air supplies with air being delivered from outside the laboratory space. The strategies for biosecurity, which are protections against deliberate release of pathogens, again, include a combination of controls, engineering controls, such as entrance controls to detect unauthorized entrance, video surveillance and video archiving to detect and record unauthorized activities, and operational controls, particularly a two-person rule, so that there are two persons present at all time during activities in the research area to uh, vet and detect unauthorized activities. And management controls, including registration and inspection of facilities, personnel reliability assurance with uh, background checking, personnel training, inventory monitoring, and incident reporting. And turning to bio risk assessment, the strategy involves two parts. The first part is identification of proposed high risk research on pathogens which is defined as proposed research activities reasonably anticipated to increase a pathogen's transmissibility or pathogenesis or ability to overcome immune response or ability to overcome a vaccine or drug or to reconstruct an eradicated pathogen. One first must identify such activities when they are proposed before they are performed. One then must carry out a formal risk benefit assessment of those identified high risk activities. This entails enumerating the risks, enumerating the benefits, weighing the risks against the benefits, and reaching a decision, either to proceed as proposed, or to proceed with additional risk mitigation measures, or not to proceed. What is the current status of biosafety, biosecurity, and biorisk assessment? And I will present this status for the U.S., but virtually everything I say about the U.S. will apply also to other nations, most of which pattern their practices on U.S. practices. There are major issues. A first major issue is that all oversight of biosafety, biosecurity, and biorisk assessment is performed by the same national agencies that perform research and fund research. This creates an inherent conflict of interest. The agencies consistently have been reluctant to investigate their own research and their own funded research and consistently have opposed and in some cases obstructed efforts to improve standards of biosafety, biosecurity, and biorisk assessment for their research and their funded research. A second major issue is the absence of regulations with force of law for biosafety and biorisk assessment. And a third major issue is the inadequacy of regulations with force of law for biosecurity. I will now turn to each of the three areas in turn, uh, providing a more detailed presentation. With respect to biosafety, again, protection against accidental release, there are specific regulations with force of law for work with smallpox virus, but there are no specific regulations with force of law for any other pathogen. There are only guidelines. Those guidelines apply only to federally funded research and only to the subset of federally funded research that is unclassified. And those guidelines are administered by the same agencies that perform the research and fund the research, namely the CDC, the, the NIH and the CDC, which have inherent conflicts of interest, as I've described. Fundamentally, all decisions on controls and standards are left to the discretion of researchers and the researchers' institution. Under the guidelines, these decisions are left to researchers and institutions. This is why EcoHealth Alliance and Wuhan Institute of Virology could conduct field study often with no personal protective equipment or inadequate personal protective equipment. This is why those entities could work with potential pandemic pathogens in a laboratory at biosafety level two, rather than at a higher biosafety level that would be effective for that work. The decisions were left to the discretion of the researchers and their institutions. With respect to biosecurity, again, protections against deliberate release, there are regulations with force of law in effect for 67 human livestock and crop pathogens and toxins that are deemed to have high potential for use as bioweapons. These 
uh, agents are referred to as select agents and the regulation is the select agent rule. The select agent rule specifies administrative controls, including lab registration, lab inspection, operational planning, personnel reliability assurance, personnel training, inventory monitoring and incident reporting. But the select agent rule does not specify engineering controls other than entrance controls. In particular, it has no requirement for video monitoring or video archive. And it does not specify operational controls. In particular, it has no requirement for a two-person rule, for biosafety controls, or even for biosafety standards. Most decisions on engineering controls and all decisions on operational controls are left to the discretion of researchers and the researcher's institution. So there is, in fact, a regulation with force of law. It is effective for administrative controls and paperwork, but in practice, it misses the most important practical functions of biosecurity. And it is administered by agencies that perform research and fund research, in this case, the CDC and the USDA, uh, posing inherent conflicts of interest. And there are no regulations with force of law, not even guidelines for pathogens other than the 67 select agents. Turning to bio-risk assessment, there is a requirement for international risk benefit assessment for all research on smallpox virus through the WHO Advisory Committee on Variola Virus Research. Before 2014, there was no national or international level oversight of high-risk research on any other pathogen. Between 2014 and 2017, in the United States, a, morata a moratorium was implemented on federal funding for, quote, gain-of-function research of concern, end quote which was defined as research activities reasonably anticipated to increase the transmissibility or pathogenicity of influenza, SARS, or MERS viruses. This policy was referred to as the pause. Under the pause, 18 projects were paused. But within two months of the start of the pause, seven of those 18 projects were exempted based on a determination by the NIH director that the projects were, quote, urgently necessary to protect the public health or national security, end quote. And many covered projects, most covered projects, including the projects by EcoHealth Alliance and Wuhan Institute of Virology were not paused due to a failure of NIH to identify all covered projects. In 2017 to the present, the pause was replaced by a requirement for uh, Health and Human Service Department level risk benefit assessment prior to funding, quote, potential pandemic pathogen enhancement, end quote, which was defined as research activities reasonably anticipated to increase transmissibility or pathogenicity of a potential pandemic pathogen. And this policy is referred to as the HHS P3CO framework, where P3CO stands for potential pandemic pathogen care and oversight. Under the P3CO framework, Covered projects are supposed to be identified by HHS funding agencies, namely NIH and CDC. And those covered projects then are supposed to be reviewed by an HHS secretary, a cabinet secretary level committee. Two previously paused projects, two projects that came from the pause period in 2014 to 2017 have been reviewed, but only one new project has been reviewed. Most covered projects, the overwhelming majority of covered projects, including again the EcoHealth Wuhan Institute of Virology project, have not been reviewed due to the failure of NIH to identify, flag, and forward most covered projects for review. So there have been in this period policies in effect, but they have existed more on paper than in practice. What are the crucial next steps? McLeod, there are yes. five minutes left. Is it okay for you? Easy. So okay. the crucial next steps that apply to all three of these areas, biosafety, biosecurity, and bio-risk assessment, the first and most important is to assign oversight of biosafety, biosecurity, and bio-risk assessment to an independent national agency, an agency that does not perform research and does not fund research, eliminating the conflict of interest. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which oversees work with fissionable materials, could provide a model both for function and for funding of this independent oversight. 
Second crucial step is to enact regulations with force of law for biosafety, biosecurity, and biorisk assessment. These regulations need to be universal. They need to be independent of the funding source and independent of the classification status of the work. They need to be specific. They cannot leave key decisions to the discretion of researchers and their institutions. They need to be monitored and they need to be enforced. None of these things is, is in effect currently. After these features are in place in the United States, the United States should work to harmonize oversight of biosafety, biosecurity, and biorisk assessment internationally with its partners and allies, and also with other nations. Again, I mentioned that other nations have typically mirrored, often directly verbatim copied the policies in the US. So establishment of effective policies in the US provides a basis for harmonization of those policies internationally. And oversight of the very highest risk research with pathogens, research involving potential, path potential pandemic pathogen enhancement should be assigned to an international agency. And the WHO Advisory Committee on Variola Virus Research provides a model both for function and for funding of such an agency. Specifically with respect to biosafety, uh, we need regulations with force of law for biosafety. We need them for all pathogens. We need enhanced mandatory, not discretionary engineering controls, enhanced mandatory, not discretionary operational controls, enhanced mandatory, not discretionary administrative controls, and we need to tighten the assignments of pathogens to biosafety levels. For example, we need to reassign SARS-related and MERS-related coronaviruses from biosafety level two, where they currently are in all cases, except SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, and MERS-CoV-1, and reassign them to biosafety level three or higher. With respect to biosecurity, we need regulations with force of law for biosecurity, not merely for 67 bioweapons agents, select agents, but for all pathogens. We need enhanced mandatory engineering controls. In particular, we need a requirement, a mandated requirement for video surveillance of work areas, for archiving and long-term uh, storage of video records, for select agent pathogens. We need enhanced mandatory operational controls. And in particular, we need a mandated two-person rule, mandated specific biosafety controls, and mandated specified biosafety levels for select agent pathogens. And for bio-risk assessment, we need to have policies that exist in practice as well as paper. There needs to be an effective identification of all covered research, and there needs to be a risk-benefit assessment of all covered research. There needs to be mandatory compliance with review decisions. They cannot be merely advisory. There needs to be monitoring and enforcement of compliance with review decisions, and there need to be consequences for violations. There needs to be transparency at every step in that identification and review process. So these are necessary steps if we wish to avoid a next pandemic in our lifetimes or even in the next decade, we need to enhance biosafety, biosecurity, and biorisk assessment. And we can proceed, as we heard in the last presentation, without knowing definitively or even approximately how the current pandemic occurred. We know that this is a source of vulnerability. We know that a pandemic can emerge in this way. We need to take the steps to prevent that. So I thank you for your attention.